Shall we bow? Our Heavenly Father, we want to appreciate uh, your sure mercies that you have given us through your Son today, that uh, we may gather as a family and be able to share in thy word. And Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit may work uh, on our hearts, that we may receive the message you have for us with gladness at the end of the day that uh, we may walk closer to thee in every way of our life that you may guide our steps and even our lips that in these days that we are living in lord we may understand what uh, your son is doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary and so lord as we study your word may the presence of your spirit and the holy angels abide with us this is my prayer in christ jesus name amen uh, uh, I'm glad to be joined with you once again. Uh, it has been a while, and uh, we appreciate the Lord for all the things that he has been doing for us. And uh, today, I'm going to speak about uh, the, uh, the good news about judgment, or you can uh, call it uh, the benefits of atonement. Uh, I saw it fit that uh, we may remind ourselves of... Uh, the things that are going on in the heavenly sanctuary and what the Lord expects of us in this time and age that we are living in as his people. And so uh, I, I want us to look at uh, the Bible, what it talks about, the good news about judgment and uh, the benefits that comes with the atonement that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary. And um, I'll be sharing my Bible app, which is essentially E.G. White Bible app. You can uh, follow up with your Bible. And uh, I'd like to start in a familiar place. And uh, this is uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8. And uh, we see what the Lord is speaking to us. Hebrews chapter 8 from verses 7. This is what we read. Uh, from verse 6. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Which was established upon better promises. So we expect that uh, the covenant that we are living under is a covenant of better promises. And that is what we are going to see uh, about uh, the good news about judgment and the benefits of atonement that uh, we are having in this uh, uh, day of atonement. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, we find that uh, Christ, by his death, he has made a better covenant for us. And how is this covenant a better covenant that has better promises? He is saying that it's a new covenant. So if it's a new covenant, then we must understand what was the old covenant. And the old covenant, you can find it in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 13. Uh, the book of uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 13, here is where we have the old covenant, and we shall be seeing how it is different from the covenant with better promises uh, the old covenant he says that uh, and he declared unto you his covenant which he commanded you to perform even the ten commandments and he wrote them upon the two tables of stone so we find that the old covenant it is the same ten commandments but it was written on the table of stone and then when we go back to the new covenant we are so told, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. 
Now, the covenant itself per se did not have a problem, but he found the problem with the people. But again, you have to realize that Deuteronomy 4.13, it's saying that uh, the covenant was written on the table of stones. But uh, this new covenant in Hebrews 8.10, it says, For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws into their mind. This is the issue, the great issue before us. The Lord putting his covenant upon uh, our mind. Unlike in the old covenant where the laws were put on the table of stones. And he says that, And I'll write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. That in itself uh, tells you how the new covenant is beneficial unto us because the old covenant, we are told that uh, the commandments were written on the stone, but the new covenant, the law is written upon the table of our hearts, that is our mind. And so that uh, we may reflect fully the image of God, that uh, our minds may be sealed unto the Lord and they may reflect the image of God. But uh, looking at uh, the old covenant as we continue learning in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter Hebrews chapter 9 Hebrews chapter 9 just still reconsidering this old covenant we are told, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went all the way into the first tabernacle camp and accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself. Pardon, please. Are you saying that... Uh, but in the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. Now look at this statement that is made here in the first covenant in the old system the sacrifices could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience so there was a matter of conscience which was to be perfected when the atonement or the sacrifices were made but in the first tabernacle we are told that uh, the services could not make uh, him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the con to the conscience and so 10, uh, Hebrews 9, 10 tells us, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And you shall see this in the book of Acts, what it means by the time of uh, reformation. It is the time of restitution. But let me just go on here before I go to, I switch to Acts chapter 3. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, this is the new covenant by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, which could not make the comers therein perfect, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For... If the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an hay for sprinkling uh, the unclean sanctifies the, to the purifying of the flesh. So you can see what uh, the old system could do, that uh, it could not make the commas therein perfect, and then it was for the purifying of the flesh. But Christ having entered in the heavenly sanctuary, not with the blood of goats, not with the blood of the lambs, not with the blood of the bullocks. He ended with his own blood 
And why is that more important? It's because when uh, the Kamas into the sanctuary came there with uh, their sacrifice, it was a bull, it was a ram, or it was a lamb, which had had not an experience in matters containing to living a human life and being there for uh, 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 enough to make uh, a recompense for the law that was broken. But now Christ coming in humanity with the sinful, in the likeness of the sinful nature, he lived the life that human beings are supposed to live and he was made perfect by obedience to his father. And then he gives us his life, not like the life of the gods or the life of the lambs, but his own life, his own experience, he gives unto us that experience, that humanity combined with divinity which overcame sin, and then we are able to overcome sin as he overcame. Looking at uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 9, continuing on, in verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so, uh, the old sacrifices, what was offered with, was the blood of the lambs, the blood of the gods, the bloods of the bullocks. But under the new covenant, it is the blood of Jesus Christ, which by eternal spirit, he offered himself without the spot. And then we are told in Galatians 4, verses 6, that... Uh, uh, and because he has sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Which means that uh, the self-same spirit that overcame sin is what we are given also to overcome sin. And so we have an advantage uh, um, uh, because the people in the old covenant looked unto the cross, but the people under the new covenant looks back at what happened at Calvary and what is going on in the most holy place. The book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, looking at uh, this old covenant. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. And this is the work that Christ is doing in the most uh, holy place to purge our conscience from sins so that we may uh, offer an offering which is acceptable before the Lord. Unlike in the olden covenant which the comers there in had to offer blood daily on the daily services. And there is a reason why it is called a daily services because it was a system of sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. But uh, on the day of atonement, uh, that uh, the comers in are sanctified the, by the blood of Jesus Christ, which purges the conscience, conscience not to serve the dead works. We are told in uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of the bulls and the goats should take away sins. Wherefore he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wilt not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. A body for what purpose? What is the purpose? The purpose of this body, we are told in First um, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, as we look at this issue of uh, the good news about judgment and the benefits of atonement, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16, why is the body prepared then? Know ye not, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And so, now our bodies become the habitation of that Shekinah glory that uh, used to fill the temple once the sacrifices were accepted on the Day of Atonement. And what Christ is doing is to purify our souls and our bod bodies 
so that it may be a habitation of his Holy Spirit, that Shekinah glory that shows that we have been accepted on the day of atonement. And uh, we were, uh, I said that uh, the old covenant could not make the commas there imperfect. And as long as the first tabernacle stood, the way into the most holiest was not yet known. And the reason why the most uh, holy place was revealed is for the time of reformation, which is a time of restitution. Now, when you look at Acts chapter 3 from verse 19, it tells you what is this time of reformation and the time of restitution. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And we know that the blotting out of the sins was done on the day of atonement, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So in this time of blotting out of sin, there is a time of, uh, of refreshing that is coming from the Lord. And we know this refreshing is made possible by the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure so that we may have the fullness of God. We may just look as Jesus Christ looks like. In verses 20 of Acts chapter 3, we are told, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, and then look at this. We are talking about the time of reformation, which is the time of restitution. Whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of holy prophets, since the world began. And now when you look at the day of atonement and the blotting out of sin, the person who is sent is Jesus Christ himself. And so we understand while Jesus Christ ministers in the heavenly sanctuary, he is still the minister of it his earthly sanctuary by his representative the holy spirit that he is working in the hearts of men he is still walking in the candlestick he's still walking amongst his people to cleanse them from his impurities and he will do that we are told until the restitution of all things whatever the devil took from adam has to be given back to the children of god in this time of restitution and the greatest thing and the greatest robbery that has been uh, done to humani hum humanity is the taking away of the image of God, the defacing of the image of God through sin and the devil. That is what he did to Adam. And this has to be uh, 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 given back to humanity in this time of restitution by the power of uh, the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord is in the business of... Uh, 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 saving his people and making them whole again in this day of uh, atonement. And so, looking at uh, the good news about judgment, I'll just switch over to the book of Daniel chapter 7 then, because this is the main study uh, that I'm looking at, the main topic that I'm looking at, the benefits of atonement and the uh, 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 what we call the good news about judgment. Daniel chapter 7, uh, I'd like us to look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to verses 13, which are compelling verses. And these are the verses that uh, um, gives us an, our identity. As Seventh-day Adventists, we know that uh, the text that gave birth to Seventh-day Adventists is and to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But before you read Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, we have this Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 13, and this is where I want us to dwell so much. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancients of, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Now, uh, these thrones, we are told, they were cast down. We are, uh, if you read the, the, the book Broadside, I think it is volume 1, it tells you that these were new thrones. These were not all thrones that were in the most holy place, but new thrones were brought in in the most holy place. And the ancient of the days did sit down i can give you the reference if you want it a fiery stream issued 
and came forth from before him, verse 10, thousand thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Now, this is what I'm talking about, the good news about judgment, and these books being open. What is so good about this judgment that is being set on the day of atonement, because we know books were not found in the holy place, but books were only found in the most holy place. And so we can be sure, Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 10 onwards, is speaking about the most holy place because books were never found in the holy place. Books were found in the most holy place. And so we can be sure this is the day of atonement because uh, 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 the Father has just moved in the most holy place. And this is good in defending our theology. We can prove our theology from the Bible without going anywhere else. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is important. And so, why was this judgment set? What is so good about this judgment? Verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. Now, this judgment is being set in correspondence with the words which the horn spake. And what is the horn speaking? We understand that this horn is the Roman hierarchy or the Roman Empire and uh, it is uh, the great words corresponds to the blasphemous words which the little horn speaks and from Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 we understand that the little horn is the beast that rises from the sea which is the papacy and so judgment is being set and the books are open but for what reason in what correspondence with the great words which the horn spoke or spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And so as the judgment is going on, something is happening that uh, it is in correspondence with what the little horn speaks and it is to determine the end of the beast which is being slain and given to the burning of, uh, of, of the flame. Verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. This verse 12 has been a revelation to me. It has been an anchor point in the book of, uh, of, the book of Daniel chapter 7. That uh, as concerning the rest of the beast, which are these rest of the beast we are talking about? When you read the book of Daniel chapter 7, we have actually uh, Babylon which is represented by the lion then we have uh, uh, the Medo-Persian kingdom which is represented by the bear one side lifted up and having the three ribs in its mouth and we are having the Grecian Empire which is uh, the leopard like beast uh, having the four wings and so we are told as concerning these three their dominion was taken away. But yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So you ask yourself, what uh, or which beast was their life prolonged in? And we find that the beast that followed these three is the fourth beast, which was a nondescript beast. Why is it a nondescript beast in uh, Revelation? Revelation chapter 13, we are told, and the beast which I saw was like unto the leopard, Revelation 13, 2, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as a mouth of a lion. This is why Daniel could not be able to say what kind of beast it was, but he said just a terrible beast, an undescript beast. The life of the other three were prolonged in this beast. Now, you, you can just look at um, the other three beasts. What was their life? What was their characteristics? You find Babylon, which was tied to their false gods. And you find the Medo-Persian Empire, which, which had it is infallible laws. And you have the Grecian Empire, which was uh, a kingdom which uh, prided in philosophical matters. And their characters, their life was prolonged into the fourth beast, which is the Roman hierarchy. That is why in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, you find that it is a composite beast of this first three in the book of Daniel chapter 7. 
Now, this is what I want us to understand, the benefits of this um, uh, judgment and the atonement that is going on. As judgment is going on, atonement is also going on because the books are open and uh, every case is being determined. But uh, then you have to jump as the life of uh, these three beasts are being prolonged in the fourth empire, there is another beast which his life has to be prolonged in the life of those who forms part of his kingdom. Let me repeat this, that uh, we have the three beasts and their belief system, their character, and their uh, uh, practices are prolonged into the fourth, fourth beast, which is the Roman hierarchy. Now, something interesting about the fourth beast in Revelation chapter 13, in verse 3, uh, in verse uh, 2, you find that uh, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his authority. So, you can be sure that this fourth monarch or the little horn, it is working under the inspiration and the power and the authority of the dragon, which in Revelation chapter 12, we find that it is the serpent, that all serpent, the dragon, the deceiver, and Satan himself. And so you will expect that the saints will not be part of this system of the fourth beast, but they will be a part of another system. And so if people are partaking in the time of judgment, in the day of atonement, the precepts, the character, and the life of this fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7, you expect the saints on the same day of atonement to be partaking of something different. And that is where uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 comes in. Look at the word the Bible says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Previously, in Daniel chapter 7, verses, um, uh, verses 11, you find that he spoke great words. And because of speaking these great words, he was slain and given to the burning of the flame. Continued on in 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws they shall be given unto, into his hand, until a time and times and the dividing of the time. Then we are told, but the judgment shall sit, as we have seen in, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9, 10, and 11. But the judgment shall sit, and why does judgment sit? Uh, this is where I want you to see the benefits of atonement and uh, the good news about judgment. When this judgment sits and the books are open, what they do is they take away his dominion. Praise the Lord. This is the good news about judgment. This is the, uh, 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 the, the, the benefits of atonement. Because what the Lord does is to take away the dominion of the little horn, of this fourth empire. And what is he doing? To consume and to destroy it unto the end. So when the judgment sits, and we understand that judgment started in 1844, the main work of the high priest, the Lord of Lords, and the God of Heaven, is to take away the dominion of the little horn. Is to take away the power, the authority, and uh, all this uh, 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 dominion that uh, the devil or Satan himself has given to the fourth beast or the little horn uh, uh, in Daniel chapter 7. And as he does that, as he takes away this dominion from 1844 until the end, what is he doing in Daniel 7, 27? And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of his kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So, brothers and sisters, this is the thing, that uh, judgment is good news, atonement is good news, because what Christ is doing is cleansing the soul temple so that uh, the dominion of the devil, the dominion of Satan, his life, his pre precepts, and his authority in our lives may be taken away so that um, 
the authority, the dominion, and the precepts of the kingdom of heaven may be put in our hearts so that we may serve the Lord and obey him, not only here on earth, but obey him eternally. And I believe that is the good news about atonement. That is the good news about judgment. And uh, he thought, he says, this is the end of the matter. As for Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. While Daniel is left worrying about these things, we are not to be left worrying about them because in Daniel chapter 8, verses 14, uh, we are told in Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, we are told, uh, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. You know, we are told in Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59, we are told that uh, our iniquities have separated between us and our God. And so, the good news about judgment, the good news about atonement is that the Lord is taking away our iniquities so that this separation that has existed for all these years might be taken away. And so the Lord says that uh, I'll write my laws into their hearts. I'll write my laws into their hearts. But let us think again about this as we enter into this last segment of uh, uh, the good news about judgment and the benefits of atonement. Why does Christ have to cleanse his temple and how does that relate unto us? The book of um, uh, first, uh, second Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 onward. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, all things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. I want us to look at this verse again, these verses again, with a view of what is happening in the heavenly sanctuary. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, picture this. On the day of atonement, we had the high priest going into the most holy place. And as he went into the most holy place, we are told in Leviticus chapter 16, from uh, verses 12 onward, that Aaron offered a sacrifice for himself and his house, the Levites. And why were they to be made sacrifice for? Why did he make a sacrifice for his house and um, uh, for the Levites? And this is the very thing that uh, we read in uh, Second Corinthians, that uh, after we have been made a new creature, we are given the ministry of reconciliation. And so the good news about judgment, the good news about atonement, is that we share in the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this is what I was speaking. That in the day of atonement, Aaron went into the most holy place, but he offered a sacrifice for his house and the Levites, so that they may be able to minister into the courtyard. They may be able to assist in prayers, to pray for the high priest when he was there and then pray for the congregation to be able to fast and pour out their hearts so that if there were any sins still unrepented, they may repent it and they may be forgiven. And so they were like a, 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 a go between the high priest and the people. They were standing in the middle of the people and we shall see that in a little while in the book of Joel. And Christ now, that was the typical service, but now Christ is in the most holy place. He's in the most holy place, and he expects the priests to be in the courtyard. The courtyard, as we know, represents the earth, and so he should be having a people on the earth who stands as the priest in the courtyard to be able to stand between the sinners and the high priest. I'm not talking about human beings becoming mediators or intercessors per se, because we have only one mediator and one intercessor between man uh, and God, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. But there was a work which this priest had to do in the courtyard to be praying for the high priest and to be praying for the people. 
for the high priest not to be slain of his sins and that he may come from the most holy place so that he may bless the people and for the people who are gathered in the uh, in the congregation or uh, 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 outside the camp so that if there be anything in their hearts they may confess of it and they may be forgiven so that the day of atonement may not pass if there is uh, still anyone who has not been reconciled unto God and so continuing with those with that thought after we have received the benefits of atonement we have been made whole again Jesus says that he is going to use us as a people who will participate in the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation you and me who have received the benefits of atonement now have to participate in the ministry of reconciliation we have been entrusted with the word of reconciliation because all things have done what passed away behold all things are new we cannot serve in the ministry of reconciliation when we are still entertaining the old self we must become new bottles to receive the new wine to be able to give to the people as it were uh, when jesus christ fed 5,000 and 4,000, you find that Jesus broke the bread and then he offered the prayer, which is like the ministry of intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. Then he gave the breads unto his disciples and as the bread came from Jesus Christ to the disciples, it multiplied and it was able to feed the whole multitude. So as Christ is doing his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary he breaks the bread he intercedes and then he breathes upon his ministers as it is written to the angels and the stars of the seven churches then these stars the messengers and uh, the angels of those churches are able to feed the church which uh, should be able to understand the ministry of christ in the heavenly sanctuary and so Christ makes us to be partakers of what is going on in the heavenly sanctuary. And then now, then we are ambassadors of Christ, which means that uh, our life now is not anchored upon the things of the earth, but the things of heaven. An ambassador represents his country in a foreign country. And so, as citizens of heaven, we represent heaven here on earth, which is a foreign country to us because the old things have gone and we have become new things this is the good news about judgment and the good news about atonement that is going on in the heavenly sanctuary we become part of the reconciliatory team uh, uh, on the uh, sin issue and so uh, christ will want to use me and you to do a work that has never been done on this earth and that is to be able to preach the gospel as a witness you see, we talk about uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 14. The gospel of this kingdom shall be preached as a witness uh, to all nations, then the end shall come. Now, if you have to preach about the message of the day of atonement, you should be able to share in the ministry itself. You should be able to share in the atonement itself. You cannot tell the people how to stand during the day or the, the investigative judgment when you yourself cannot be able to stand during the investigative judgment. We must preach the message as a witness that Christ has done something in our lives and then we can be able to recommend the same Jesus Christ to other people. The reason why the message has not have it is impetus and uh, it is power is because we have been trying to preach out to the people something that has not been seen as a witness in our own lives. But we are told that the glory of the Lord shall fill the whole earth. That glory is a knowledge of the Father and the Son and what they can accomplish in the person who accepts them. Once the person accepts them and they write their law in his heart, they come and make their abode in our hearts. We are told in John chapter 14, verse 22 downwards, 23, that the Father and the Son shall come and make an abode in our hearts. And then we see in Revelation chapter 3 that they are knocking on the table of our hearts so that we may open 
they may come sup with us. So when we open up and they come, and then when the sacrifices were offered on the day of atonement, the Shekinah glory filled the temple. The Holy Spirit shall fill us. That is the glory of Revelation chapter 18 verse 1 and Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. We shall be filled with the glory of the Lord and then the glory of the Lord shall be upon all the earth. That is what Hebrews chapter 8 says that uh, we shall not teach each other saying know the Lord because the glory of the Lord shall fill the whole earth. Now look at this point as we bring this to an end. Uh, in the book of uh, Isaiah, I'm reading the last things. Isaiah chapter uh, 60. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Now, we know that the glory of the Lord came and filled the temple during the day of atonement. That Shekinah glory came and filled the temple during the day of atonement. And that is what Christ is doing. He wants to fill our heart with his own Holy Spirit. For which reason? For behold... The darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now, the main purpose for the Lord filling our hearts with his own glory is because the whole world is a mask in sin and it is in darkness. And so what the world needs at that time that is in darkness is a light. What is the purpose of the light during the time of darkness? Is to show the pathway is to show the people the, the route to walk in. It is to illuminate their way so that they may not be able to stumble as they walk in the journey, as they walk in this world that is filled of darkness. And where are the people to see the light? The people are to see the light in the people who have received the benefits of atonement, the people who are glorifying in the judgment that is going on because while the judgment is going on, the dominion of the little horn is taken away. That authority, that power that he was given by the dragon, that, that old serpent, to perpetuate sin. There is nothing that uh, the dragon appointed the beast or the little horn to do. He only appointed that apostate movement so that it may perpetuate it is evil. While he works on the background, this system is on the forefront working for darkness and not light in the world. And the church of God must be the light bearers. And so we are told uh, in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, you can guess where I'm going. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And so the church has no business in hiding its true identity and why it has been called on this day of atonement. It has been called to be a lighthouse. It should be a light on the hill. And a light on the hill illuminates the ground below so that the people who are walking on the ground below may be able to see uh, the path or the route they are walking on. And this is why we have been called at a, such a time as this. And so we go back to Isaiah. We are told, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And what will happen? And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. And so, brethren and sisters, this is what we are looking for. This is what I'm looking for personally, for the Shekinah glory to fill my heart, for the Shekinah glory to, full, to fill the movement that it's saying that it knows the Father and the Son, and there's a reason for knowing the Father and the Son, so that the light may be illumined in the whole world that is in darkness. We are told in 1 uh, uh, in, uh, Peter, uh, look at the book of 1 Peter, the reason of uh, knowing the Father. Uh, first Peter, I'll go to, sorry, Second Peter. Look at Second Peter then. Second, Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, here it is. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained a like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ. So these people have received the righteousness of God. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God 
and of Jesus Christ. So the world that is filled with darkness, it has to see grace and peace being multiplied in the people that are saying they know the Father and His Son. That is the whole reason of knowing the Father and the Son. People just have this knowledge as um, an information, but we must have it as an experiential knowledge. The partaking of that divine nature after escaping the corruption that is in this world, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4. And then grace and peace be, will be multiplied unto us, and then the people shall come unto our light. One last point is this. On the day of atonement, there is something that uh, the priest used to wear, and this is in Exodus, when he ministered before uh, the Lord, um, and uh, this should be in uh, Exodus chapter 23, verses 36. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, and grave upon it like the engravings of the signets, and this plate had an engraving holiness to the Lord. So that is what the high priest wore on the day of atonement, the plate on his forehead. And we find that Jesus Christ is doing the same work of making sure that uh, our minds are purified so that our head must have the same thing that is on the forehead of the high priest, which is holiness to the Lord. And um, look at Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. In this day of atonement, what is the Lord trying to accomplish in our life? In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And so we are in the period where on the day of atonement, the high priest had a plate engraven, holiness to Jehovah, and what the Lord is seeking to do in this day of atonement when judgment is going on is to engrave on our minds, uh, uh, um, on our minds, uh, the signet, the Lord, our righteousness, so that we may reproduce his righteousness, his word we may be sealed in it, that we may not be able to uh, 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 to sin against him. In, uh, in the book of uh, 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 Joel chapter 2, where I'm going to end, Joel chapter 2, uh, this is the work of the high priest, of the priest during this um, uh, day of atonement. What are they to do then? As we bring this to a close, Joel chapter 2, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. This was done on the day of atonement. The, peop the trumpets had to blow to warn people of the day of atonement. They had to sanctify a fast, that is a holy fast, and they had to call a solemn assembly. And the work of the priest was to gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to the reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So, friends, the little horn is speaking great words and blasphemy. The life of the first three beasts in Daniel chapter 7 is being continued in this fourth beast. We need a people upon the face of the earth whose life, who the life of Jesus Christ is also continued in them. We have Jesus Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the beast as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And also he's a beast, a lamb, a lamb for sacrifice and a lion for conquering the dominions that should be conquered. And so we have a twofold ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. That is the cleansing and the giving of the dominion. From the same Jesus Christ, he is the lamb and he is the lion. And you find that we have another beast which is doing the 
bidding of Satan on the earth. And we have to have a people who are doing the bidding of the beast lamb, uh, the lamb beast and the lion beast on the face of the earth. That they may be receiving atonement and as a lion conquering every dominion of the little horn or Satan. And how can we be able to conquer the dominion of the little horn? We are to take our sins and give to the high priest so that he may be able to place the sins of the people on the head of Azazel, the escape god. The reason why Christ cannot become a king right now, it is because people have not handed over the sin so that he may lay over to the Azazel or the escape god on the day of atonement. And so we are told that uh, after this is accomplished, there is no more sacrifices for sin. And sorry, I have to revisit this. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. That uh, we read in uh, verse uh, 14 to verse 16. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Where of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Look at our verse. Now, where remission of this is, there is no more offering of sin. Where sins have been forgiven, and the people sanctified, and the laws put on their hearts, there is no more offering for sin. Now, when there is no more offering of sin, then Christ can come and claim the people on the earth as his own people, a church which shall be a true bride for Christ, a church without spot. My prayer is that uh, you may partake of these benefits of atonement, you may be able to rejoice in the good news about judgment because it is to take away the dominion of Satan, the dominion of sin that he has put in our hearts, and then to give us a kingdom, to give us the dominion, to give us a power to be able to demolish all the strongholds of the devil. I pray that this may be your prayer, that the Lord will work in your heart, and the Lord will work in my heart, so that we may come to a place we may be able to participate in the ministry of reconciliation and may the Lord bless us with those remarks. We shall pray and then uh, be able to welcome uh, our comments or questions. Uh, shall we bow for our, our word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we say once again thank you so much for uh, another chance for to share in your word and see what your son is doing in the most holy place. Father, we don't want to be left behind serving the fourth beast, the little horn, but we want to serve this kingdom of uh, the lamb and the lion and to receive the benefits of atonement, Lord, that we may be able to share in the ministry of reconciliation. And so, Lord, as you minister unto your children on this earth, do not pass us by, but um, let your kingdom be revealed in our hearts that uh, uh, your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. So bless your children this morning, wherever they are gathered, and those who are in different places at this evening, bless them too. In Christ Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.